We came across the story of a blues man from the 1930s, a guy called Robert Johnson. Now the story goes that Robert Johnson sold his soul to the devil at the crossroads in the deep south. He sold his soul and in return he was given the secret of a black technology, a black secret technology that we know to be now as the blues. The blues begat jazz, the blues begat soul, the blues begat hip hop, the blues begat R&B. Now, flash forward 200 years into the future. Next figure, another hoodlum, another bad boy scavenger poet figure. He's called a data thief. 200 years into the future, the data thief has told a story. If you can find the crossroads, a crossroads, this crossroads, if you can make an archaeological dig into this crossroads, you'll find fragments, techno fossils, and if you can put those elements, those fragments together, you'll find the code. Crack that code and you'll have the keys to your future. You've got one clue, and it's a phrase, mothership connection. The Mothership Connection, it's kind of George Clinton's obvious, uh, it's his 1974 album in which uh, you have uh, an alien, you have George Clinton who's like an alien in kind of silver foil and he's kind of getting out of a spaceship. You can't work out whether he's getting out of the spaceship or getting back into the spaceship. By this time, black music had, black itself had become commercial. You know, it was hip to be black, you know, into the music, you know, the dance bands of James Brown and uh, all of that. So, and hip hop, I mean, rock and roll had just like faded out, you know, in 69. So it's time to make a change. This figure is a thief. He's a data thief. And he's surfing across the internet of black culture, breaking into the vaults, breaking into the rooms, and stealing fragments. Fragments from cyber culture, techno culture, narrative culture. The data thief has two gadgets that he's going to use to navigate his way through our present. A black box and a rather special pair of sunglasses. G. Clinton, George Clinton, Parliament Funkadelic, Funk, Uncut Funk. The bomb. George Clinton, I think, is a fucking maniac. I was always fond of uh, Star Trek. You know, I'm a Star Trek freak, a sci-fi freak. So the next record, I had to find another place that you hadn't perceived black people to be, and that was on a spaceship. So I pictured them in there, lean, and you know, like it was a Cadillac, you know sliding through space, you know, chilling, you know, having come here from the planet Sirius. I went to see a concert when I was a little kid at a place called the Olympia Ballroom here in Detroit. <laughs> I'll never forget it. I mean, that was like, for me, that was my first concert I've ever, ever been to in my life. And I remember it because I'll never forget this man coming out of the top of the roof on a cable, dressed in a diaper and big white platform boots, playing a guitar, and called himself Star Child. You know, and then this other dude walks out of a so-called spaceship that lands out of the middle of the stage. And these guys are playing this music. You know, when I think about it right now, I'm there. The Mothership Connection is uh, Clinton's symbol for what happens to funk when you pass it through the studio and when it becomes kind of uh, astro or becomes space or becomes extraterrestrial. The Mothership Connection is like the link between uh, Africa as a lost continent in the past and between Africa as an alien future. 
Roaming the internet, the data thief discovers a new word, Africa. Somewhere in this street is the secret of the mothership. The data thief knows that the first touch with science fiction came when Africans began playing drums to cover distance. Water carried the sound of the drums, and sound covered the distance between the old and the new world. This was the data thief's first visit, his first clue. It took him back to the new world. P-Funk is pure funk, okay? I mean, it's uh, uncut, un, um, you know, diluted. It's uh, pure funk, just uh, no, 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 no cut, no extra ingredients, no additives. He's in the land of African memory. In the history vault, a woman says, it's after the end of the world. Don't you know that yet? Confused, the data thief returns to the future. The music is different here. The vibrations are different. Sunrise. <laughs> George Clinton's mentor, period. In the new world, the data thief finds two rooms marked Lee Perry's Black Ark and Sun Ra's orchestra. You get everything with Sun Ra. You get ragtime, you cover all those periods. You get swing, you get bebop, and you get, you know, he was admired by John Cage, so you get some of that uh, European avant-garde tinge to his music. It was very difficult to have a conversation with him. You know, uh, I re recall having a discussion with him during one of his rehearsals. Every time I'd prepare to answer one of his long monologues, you know, he started the band, so I'd be drowned out. The data thief asked Sun Ra and Lee Perry for the secret of the mothership connection. And they said, our music is a mirror of the universe. We explore the future through music. The Black Ark, which is Lee Perry's studio and also his label um, the orchestra which was from about 1955 on Sun Ra's band and uh, the mothership mothership connection which was George Clinton's major earth tour uh, of about 1977 are three spaceship images that these musicians are using as vehicles for this kind of subversion that I'm talking about, or this idea that I'm talking about of exploration. I am the firmament computer. I am the sky computer. I am the orbit computer. Lee Perry? I've heard the name, but I'm not quite sure who that is. It's interesting to look at Lee Perry in reggae, George Clinton in funk, and uh, Sun Ra in jazz as three figures who are working with a shared set of mythological images and icons. I, I think it's uncanny the fact that they're all using space iconography and certain tropes of madness and extraterrestriality largely independent of one another, largely without ever having come in contact with one another's work. I cover the earth and hold it like a ball in my hand.
you know, space for black people. It's not something new. I really believe that we've been there, that we're returning to that, and that the consciousness of um, black people, all mankind, is um, striving to return to where the essence or the roots have come from. Uh, whether somebody came in, gave us our uh, uh, intellect genetically, by like cloning us or switching on our uh, genes to start evolving the way we ha have, or that we are descendants from the stars. The data thief knows there's a connection between music, space, and the future. Entering a room marked Space Exploration, he finds the name Bernard Harris, astronaut. He asks him, what does the mothership connection mean to you? Well, it means to me, uh, number one, in college, we used to party off this album quite a lot. <laughs> but it also is a reflection of one man's vision of the future and that is of, uh, of uh, us as human beings uh, exploring space, but more importantly, a black man, uh, black people out exploring space. Uh, we're doing that now, uh, we're, we're going to be doing that in the future. Roger, roll Endeavour. Roll maneuvers complete aboard Endeavour. I have always wanted to be an astronaut since I was about eight years old. I was one of those kids that was fascinated with science and science fiction. Uh, I always taught myself as one of the original Trekkies, or Trekkers, or whatever they call them these days. And uh, so uh, through that fantasy of imagining uh, being in space, then I started reading about it, I started researching NASA and finding out all about uh, uh, what it was all about. And when I saw the first human beings walk on the moon, I was hooked. That was it. I remember being so excited and in awe that we stepped on the moon. That's it. You got it right there. But coming out of it, that glorious moment, I didn't see my brother, I didn't see us there. And I decided to have a part in that when they called me in and asked me to assist them in recruiting the first women and minority astronauts for the space shuttle program. I could not say no. I knew that uh, Michelle uh, was involved with the early recruitment program that went on at NASA. In fact, from her efforts and a lot of folks here at Johnson Space Center's efforts, uh, and also probably some efforts of some of the civil rights leaders that, that we've had in this country, uh, we got our first three African-American astronauts. working at every level, scientists, uh, administrators, secretaries, photographers, journalists, all the way down to maintenance engineers were black and white. Uh, I thought, why in the world is this not being represented for the, the, the public to see? that this NASA that I'm seeing represents all of us. It looks like Star Trek. The data thief wanders through the ruins, the detritus, the wastelands of our late 20th century. And he comes across a little piece of stone, a fragment. Written on it is a strange phrase. The line between social reality and science fiction is an optical illusion. Puzzled, he wanders off in search of people who will confirm this strange theorem. 
The guy behind me to my right here is Mad, uh, Mad Mike Banks from Underground Resistance, uh, one of the pinnacle uh, techno uh, forces in Detroit at the very moment. We perpetuate the technological revolution through music. Music being something that people listen to and it opens, that's the first thing they hear. If they're going to uh, be ready for a technological future, I think music better prepares them, technological music better prepares them for the future. I think the original philosophy of um, the music that we were doing, the Detroit techno, uh, whatever it's called now, however it's been caught up, I think really, honestly, it stems from the fact that Juan Atkins, um, he had an idea, you know, that he wanted to infiltrate the music industry as a black artist doing electronic music. At the time, there were no black artists really doing it, other than George Clinton, the Parliament Funkadelic Age. Uh, there was um, a couple other people. There was George Duke, Stanley Clark, that were experimenting with it every now and then. But there was really no black artists that were moving down that lane. Uh, what well, synthesizer to me was the first uh, breakthrough for electronic music and by me frequenting uh, the, the music shops and being uh, a, a very uh, enthusiastic about science fiction, uh, science fiction and all things futuristic, of course the synthesizer represented uh, the ability to make these futuristic sounds and space sounds and UFO sounds and, and, and implement that in the music and over the tracks because I wanted to land a UFO on top of the track. The connection between the architects of Afrofuturism, between Sun Ra, Lee Perry and George Clinton, and between uh, techno and jungle later on in the 80s and the 90s, is simply that they hold nothing in common with the common idea of black music, which is that it belongs to the street or to the stage. They're neither live music nor the kind of music that exists out in the urban. They're studio musics, they're impossible imaginary musics, and yet because they're imaginary, they're even more powerful because they suggest a future. They don't reflect the past, they imagine a future. Detroit is a symbolic location in American culture because it's where the, the American automotive industry's heart was. It was, you know, the sort of industrial base. But um, once one encounters the information industry, those industries are now in decay. So now Detroit becomes a relic. It's a decaying structure at a crossroads, so to speak. Techno coming out of Detroit represents that kind of urban youth's view of, of change, of like saying no longer do we have this industrial kind of base no longer do we have this kind of security anymore. Everything is flux. I think Detroit Techno started because of the type of music that Detroiters were exposed to because of the love that DJs in Detroit still have to this day for craft work. The craft work influence helped the sequencing and the rigidness of it. The rock, the crazy sounds of it, the P funk the funk of it, the backbone, the groove. My first mission as a tribute to my heritage as a, as a black person in this world, uh, I flew a flag that was a, a combination of all the uh, country's flags of, of the continent of Africa. So I had this, and my, my hopes is that this summer I will, uh, when I'm visiting Africa, that I will take it around to the different uh, countries and, and display this. And, and why? Why? Because, uh, you know, this is my heritage. And to say that uh, I know, acknowledge that I know that black people were the first astronomers and mathematicians uh, in this world. 
and uh, it seems only natural that uh, one of their sons would come back from space and say, hey, look what we have accomplished together. <laughs> Electronics, which summoned up the alien, the monster. Uh, in the 70s, you had disco, which summoned up the, uh, the idea of the clone and the robotic. By the time you get to the 80s and Derek May, techno is, uh, is now something like a, a species jump. The techno to me means, um, <clears throat> I think the idea uh, for me has always been uh, to express man and machine, you know, intertwined, you know, uh, craft work. They, had, they did an album based on that philosophy of man and machine, and they called the album Man Machine, okay? Um, I think to bring these two elements together and to like take technology to a level of human, of a human instinct has always been most important for me, you know? To make people see the human side of the technology. Most people that are making this music or trying or attempting or attempting to make this music have no idea, you know, of really those two very simple elements. Just take the salt, take the pepper, mix it together, and when you come up with you have a nice piece of soup. You know, you put some onions in there and, and some croutons and you sit back and you sip it and it's good. For me, I came in really to breakbeat and breakbeat music was the main, you know, rebel driver wanting to be rebellious with music full stop, you know. Um, hip hop was generated by, you know, by breakbeat. And I think from the point of view where I am, where I'm at, we had a European background to look over our shoulder. And we had a, an American dream to look at in the, you know, in the forefront. But I think the American dream as you pursued it wasn't no longer the American dream. After the end of the world, don't you know that yet? After the end of the world, don't you know that yet? After the end of the world, don't you know that yet? Well, I've always contended that uh, black existence and science fiction are one and the same. Uh, and that's as someone who has obviously experienced life as a black person and has been reading science fiction since he was maybe nine or ten years old. After the end of the world, don't you know that yet? The form itself, the, the conventions of the, of the narrative in science fiction, in terms of the way they deal with the subject, it's usually someone who is um, at odds with the, the apparatus of power in the society and whose profound experience is one of um, cultural dislocation, alienation, estrangement. We, we don't, we're not believed. You know, we're, we're like aliens uh, trying to, uh, you know, t tell our experience to Earthlings. People don't believe us. You see, we live in, there, there's a normal life in this country. Uh, where the police don't plant evidence. They don't lie, you know, and uh, drug dealers uh, call ahead and make appointments before they execute people. This is so like the upper class white world. You know, we try to, to tell them that this is happening in Oakland where I live. You know, and they say, well, your experience is so incredible, you're making this up and you're paranoid. So I think uh, living in this country for African Americans is a far out experience. You know, when I began to go to Europe, I could come back and say that not all white people are the same. I can you know, go to Germany and Italy and places like that and have much more credibility, we can have much credibility there than here. And I think one of the reasons for that is that uh, there's a lot of denial on the part of the uh, American European population, do you understand? Greg Tate is the writer who argued that black people, uh, in America certainly, lived the estrangement that uh, science fiction writers 
kind of uh, talk about. All the stories about alien abduction, all the stories about alien spaceships taking subjects from one planet and taking them to another, genetically transforming them. Greg is really saying, Greg is kind of recasting American history in the light of science fiction and saying, well, look, all those things that you read about alien abduction and genetic transformation, they already happened. How much more alien do you think it gets than slavery, than these, than entire mass populations moved and genetically altered, entire status moved, uh, forcibly dematerialized. It doesn't really get much more alien than that. The first touch with sci-fi is when the slaves were using drums to communicate over the distance. So the slave owners would institute reforms that um, the slaves were no longer allowed to play certain rhythms, if at all. And they weren't allowed to speak even their own languages and they had to learn the, the, the slave master's language, which is English and you know, Jamaica or the States or Spanish or Portuguese. Or, but there was always a sense of um, a displacement of the original code, you know, of the language and drums with the new code or the, the downloaded new information you know, downloaded into the cortex or whatever. Most science fiction tales dramatically deal with how the individual is going to contend with these alienating, dislocating um, societies and circumstances. And that pretty much sums up, you know, the mass experience of, of black people, you know, within um, the post-slavery 20th century world. Rumor has it that before Robert Johnson made his deal with the devil at the crossroads, he couldn't play to save his life. He sold his soul, Turn, he got the secret of the blues. Our thief from the future gives up the right to belong in his time in order to come to our time to find the mothership connection. The thief becomes an angel an angel of history. The data thief can visit the old world and the new, but he cannot be a part of either. He doesn't know this is his problem, but when he makes his last trip to Africa, he will. In the 50s and 60s, uh, there was a young writer who came along called uh, Samuel R. Delaney, and uh, you know, he's like a, a bohemian black gay figure who introduced a lot of different uh, kind of uh, black and native Indian characters into science fiction. And his key book is Dahlgren, and that's a key book for black science fiction because that's the first time that black characters in science fiction aren't merely protagonists, but as it were, change the entire terms of how science fiction is written. The cities that I had in mind uh, for the side of the dialogue that my novel Dahlgren represents, um, as I said, are New York, uh, Los Angeles, Cincinnati. I can't think of a major American city uh, where half the city has not been in a ruin. In fact, the term inner city, um, which is an Ameri at this point is an American term, is the term for that burnt out section of your city where people do not live, where, you know, where, where the, 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 the general functions of, of, of urban life go on at a very depressed rate. Any music which comes from inner sea, which derives from inner sea and comes from different areas from the city, being a city which has now developed so far along the line, its multicultural status has changed, you know. And I think that the moral freedom with it is that we have no, we want to be free with our music and we want to take from whatever we want to take from. And I think the rebelliousness before was that, fuck everybody else, we want to take music from where we want to take it, because we can make something with it, which is a new rhythm to your ears, but you can't hear it. I've heard jungle songs of classical music, jungle songs of um, bits and pieces of TV commercials, jungle songs of of sounds of water running, <laughs> you know. I mean, it's 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 a true urban response in another sense of like accelerated culture as viewed through a, a, a lens of, of pot and, and LSD, which are also ways of exploring your environment too. Every day, the data thief finds new words and phrases. Today, he finds inner city and the blues. 
blues came out of a depression, without doubt. It was singing about the situation, what was going on, and, and, and playing rhythms about those kind of things. And it didn't necessarily have to have too many vocals in it, or a lot of vocal to be to say anything. The mood of that music was blue. Its frame was sad. It made a lot of different things with certain people. And I think when that music is conceived, it doesn't really have any effect on on the outside world until later on. considered as outsiders. We're considered as people who are not uh, part of the American experience. As a matter of fact, uh, in the 19th century, uh, African Americans were excluded from Fourth of July celebrations. So there's always been this a feeling in this country that we're aliens, that we don't belong here. Uh, there's always people who want us to go back to where we came from. I don't know where I would go. Maybe I'd go to Dublin because some of my ancestors are Irish. Or maybe I'd go to Tennessee because uh, some of my ancestors are Cherokee. Or maybe I'd go to Yoruba land because some of my ancestors are probably from West Africa. I wouldn't know where to go. But there's always this uh, mention that, if, you know, send us, back, send us back to some other place. Send us back to the planet of our origin. science fiction doesn't try to predict the future but rather offers a significant distortion of the present and what I mean I guess is that a lot of people when they hear the word science fiction the first thing they assume is that uh, this is a story or a novel that's going to tell them what's going to happen uh, in sometime in tomorrow or the day after and I just don't think that that's what science fiction writers are really interested in doing um, I think we sit around and we look at what we see around us um, and we say you know how could the world be different When um, Ronald Reagan had just become president, people were talking about winnable nuclear wars. And I thought, if people are falling for this kind of thing, there must be something basically wrong with, with the human species. So I thought about it, and what I wound up doing, really, was putting the thing that I came up with into the mouth of my main character. Um, I had, um, or not my main character, my aliens. I had them arrive right after a nuclear war so that I could make my point. And I had them tell my character that human beings had two, ca two characteristics that didn't work well together. Um, one, they were intelligent, and that was good, no problem. And two, they were hierarchical. And unfortunately, the hierarchical tendencies were the older. And so sometimes the intelligence was put at the service of the hierarchical behavior. Isn't it strange that in the Second World War, computer technology was used to aid and abet the military industrial complex? By the end of our century, that technology has mutated, devolved, and diversified to such a degree that African-American musicians, young black British musicians, can use computer technology to construct a soundtrack to the end of the industrial epoch. That is strange, and it's something that puzzles the data thief. Well, yeah, I think it's very true that computer technology I mean, started out in the military sphere in the post-war period. By the time you get to the uh, 80s and 90s, it's true that computer technology, um, cheap software, has now become, um, has now created what we could call an ecology, um, an analogue or a digital ecology by which you can use technology, you can use uh, synthesizers, sequences, programmers, workstations, you can now use them as uh, ways to create uh, sonic worlds and some of those sonic worlds will secede from mainstream worlds and some of them will, will be antagonistic towards it. The point is that uh, the, uh, the route through the uh, cybernetic, the route through the drum machine allows you much more possibility for that. The point is the explosion and the proliferation and mutation of uh, African derived rhythms. So yeah, um, techno and underground resistance, uh, yeah, they are waging war on mediocre audiovisual programming.
New words. Sonic warfare. Sonic Africa. Afrofuturism. Digitized diaspora. Analog ecology. He's in the land of African memory. Every entrance into these vaults brings new information of victories and defeat, dreams and catastrophes, new words, alien, slave. Well, I think what sampling technology has allowed within this area of black musical production is the creation of digitized race memory. You know, and I think that what um, sampling allows for a generation that wasn't, that, that didn't have access to music, musical education, is a way of collapsing all eras of black music into onto a chip, you know, and being able to freely reference and cross-reference, you know, all those areas of sound and all those previous generations of, of creators, um, kind of simultaneously. Object. It simply played the records. The vinyl was like uh, this, this kind of slab of material that you played and it just played the contents of it. It's only when you get to hip hop that you get the record player being used as an instrument in its own right. And you get the vinyl, you get vinyl being selected right down to the particular breakbeat and then sampled and then scratched and then used in all kinds of different terms. And we could say that one thing that uh, black producers do is that they release as what I call the entelechy of an instrument. They release the potential energy uh, which lies inert in any kind of technology. To remain on the cutting edge, you must have a, there's a certain aggression with this music which remains on the cutting edge to, to, to root out a tune, to rinse it out, to, to just to make you pay attention there and then, you know, not to be, you know, milked down time and time again where it just becomes something which, you know, on the cutting edge, you, you, you get it straight first off, straight in information, straight out in dance and straight out in aggression or movement, you know? Africa, the data thief's last visit. He would like to return home, but cannot. No escaping from this time, this space. He continues collecting information, wandering the boundaries between science fiction and social reality. This is the data thief's new home, the zone of optical illusions. Technology has broken time down, because we are the future the time we're in is the future. Because in this technology we're living in now, if I go to a little Tutsi tribe in Africa, right down in some real neck back of the woods, and show her this recordable instrument, or show her this hover mower, <laughs> or show her this, this camera that can, I can press it and I can show her an image of her there and then. We're, you know, we're then God, aren't we? We're then some kind of like, super being, we're like something else, who are we? To that, in their eyes we are, you know? But they're still there, they still exist, those people are still alive, who are out in the middle of fucking nowhere. And when you show them technology like that, then it is an optical illusion, because we're always looking for the future, and it's right, in front, right underneath our own nose, you know? It wasn't then, but it is now. Jungle describes kind of a, a changing world, you know, it's changing from something that was more analog into something that is turning totally digital. I think with Jungle, he's using, well, the rhythms anyway, rhythms that came from drums, normal drums, 
which have been like put through a process, digitised and manipulated them digitally to create sounds unheard before, you know, really. Now people ask you the difference between techno and jungle. Um, I jumped up and down to techno and Riley to play. Um, there's no difference. It's just that it wasn't what techno is, it's what we took from techno. It's like anything else, it's not what hip hop is, it's what we take from it. You know, I like stuff that, that Derek May made and stuff that Carl Craig made because it was, it came from somewhere, it was something which had a better meaning to me. Jungle, I hate the way, I, I hate the word jungle, if you want to know the truth about it. What the fuck does jungle mean? Okay, it was called breakbeat before, now it's called jungle. Where does jungle come from? What is jungle? What, what, what does that mean? Jungle actually comes from um, an area in Jamaica uh, that they call the jungle, you know, and MCs from there, I think, elaborated on that. Um, so, like, when, when it sort of, like, when it came out on sound system tapes, people, like, got latched onto it and started using it as a name. Gerald. Sad inside, happy face on the outside. Put all his heart and love into some big record company and they sold him out. Derek May, I mean, to me, it's like, you know, he kicked me off, you know, without listening to uh, It Is What It Is, Feel Surreal. All the early sort of like transmit stuff, I would, I would have been lost. So I was lucky to sort of like, to see Aries things on the radio and think, yeah, that's, that's like, that's the direction, that's where I want to go, or else I don't know what I would have been doing now. Music's made us look at music through a microscope. Technology has made us look at it through a microscope, without a doubt. Um, people say, you know, is this the future music? We are the future now. We are in the future. You know, blues wasn't made on samplers, so how can it be relevant to us? It was, it was just the music and rhythms. Those rhythms have now been recorded on various technical equipment. So therefore, we can then ca catch it and, and put it in its place in history, because it, it's there, recorded, done. And because of technology, being able to then take from any of those eras, time is irrelevant, completely irrelevant for that mannerism. Well, I think that information and technology is moving at breakneck speed right now. The techno music is uh, definitely uh, going to be a more advanced that goes along with the way information is traveling now. I think it's unconceivable as to where we will be in the next five years. But I see a lot of uh, just new ways of listening to music, new ways of um, buying music through computer networks and, uh, and, tech and techno music is, is definitely the, the sound for this uh, environment. Uh, in the 18th century, slaves like Phyllis Wheatley uh, read poetry to prove that they were human, uh, to prove that they weren't uh, furniture, to prove that they weren't robots, and to prove that they weren't animals. In that sense, uh, a certain idea of cybernetics has already uh, been applied to uh, black subjects ever since the 18th century. Um, I think what we get at the end of the 20th century in music technology is a point where uh, producers kind of willingly take on the role of the cyborg, willingly take on that man and machine interface just to explore the mutations that's already happened to them and to accelerate them some more. Now the question is like kind of cyborgs for what? Well the reason is of course to get out of here, to get out of this time here, this space now. 